At the core of your book and your work is the Lang Langs program. Can you describe what it is? Sure. So, Langlands is a mathematician. It's a name of a mathematician, Robert Langlands. Canadian born, he's still alive. He is, uh, was a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study that we talked about, where Einstein and Gödel and other great scientists have worked. In fact, he used to occupy the office of Albert Einstein at the Institute for Advanced Study. So he, uh, 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 in, in, the, in the late 60s, he came up with a set of ideas which captivated a lot of mathematicians, several generations of mathematicians by now, which came to be known as the Langlands program. And what it is about is connecting different fields of mathematics, which seem to be far away from each other. For example, number theory, which as the name suggests, deals with numbers and various equations um, with, um, you know, like x squared plus y squared equals one. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, harmonic analysis, something that any music lover can appreciate because uh, the sound of a symphony can be kind of decomposed into sounds of different instruments. And each of those sounds can be represented by a wave like this, like a sine function. Those are the harmonics. They oscillate, the period of a harmonic uh, periods of different notes are different. They correspond to different notes and different instruments, different semitones, if you will. But they all combine together into something different, something special, which, which is not, uh, cannot be reduced to any one of those. So it's the, mathematically, it's the idea that you can decompose a signal into um, as a collection, as a simultaneous oscillation of several elementary signals. Mm -hmm. That's called harmonic analysis. So what Langlands found is that some really difficult questions in number theory could be translated into much more easily tractable questions uh, in harmonic analysis. That was his initial idea. But what happened next surprised everybody that the kind of patterns that he was able to observe, the kind of regularities that he was able to observe, which were quite surprising, were subsequently found in other areas of mathematics. For example, in geometry, and eventually in quantum physics. So in fact, uh, uh, Ed Witten, who is a kind of a dean of modern theoretical physicists, a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study as well, got interested in this subject. I, I describe in my book how it happened. Um, and he was one instrumental in, um, in bridging the gap between these patterns in, found in physics and in geometry, finding kind of a, um, a substrat, a, a kind of a superstratum, if you will. It's kind of a, or a, kind of a way to connect these two things, kind of a bridge between these two fields. So I, I, subsequently I collaborate with Witten on, on this, and this has been one of the major themes of my research. Um, it's sort of, I always found it interesting uh, to connect things, to unite things. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand why, but I was always interested in when, when uh, not in working in specific field, by kind of, but kind of cutting across fields, and um, and then I, I would discover that, for instance, I, I talk to some people who know what happens in this field, but don't know what happens in the other field and or conversely. And then I would I would like find it imperative to go out and explain to them to, to the different sides what this is all about. So that more people are aware of this hidden structure, so this hidden parallels, if you will. So that's has been sort of a theme in my research. And so I guess, you know, now I kind of understand more why it's kind of a balance, you know, like the, what we talked about earlier. So can you uh, elucidate a little bit how, what are the mathematical tools that allow you to connect uh, these uh, uh, different continents of mathematics? Right. What, is there something you can convert into words that Langlands was able to find, find and you were able to explore further? I would say what it suggests is that there is some un un uh, hidden principles which we still don't understand. My, my view is that we still don't know why, that we can prove some instances of this uh, correspondences and connections. 
but we still don't know the real underlying reasons, which means that there is a new la- there is a certain layer beneath the surface that we see now. Mm-hmm. It is like, the, so the way I see it now is like this, that there is something three-dimensional like this bottle, but what we are seeing is this projection onto the table and the projection onto a wall. And then we can map things from one projection to another. And they say, oh my God, that's incredible. But the real explanation is that both of them are projections of the same thing. And that we haven't found yet, but that's what I want to find. So that's what motivates me, I would say. From number theory to geometry to quantum physics. So there is this one thing which has different projections, except it's not just a table and a wall, but there are like many different walls, if you will. So what is the philosophical implication that there is commonalities like that across these very disparate fields? It means that what what we believe are the fundamental elements of uh, of mathematics are not fundamental. There, there, there is something beyond. It's like we previously thought that atoms were indivisible. Then we found out that there is a nucleus and electrons, and the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. Then we thought, okay, protons and neutrons must be elementary. And now we know they consist of quarks. So it's, it's about kind of finding the quarks of mathematics. <laughs> And of course, beyond that, there's maybe even more. Which was my initial motivation to study mathematics, by the way, right? So, <laughs> Quarks was the first time you fell in love with understanding the nature of reality. Yeah. 